The second thing we have to do is we have to shed chemicals because they are reason for the destruction of biodiversity, poisoning of the earth and the creation of disease for people. Organic farmers are earning 10 times more because they are getting rid of the un unnecessary cost and they are getting a fair price. The combination of shedding the cost and improving your income is a good economy. Okay, first question I want to ask is about your book. What does really oneness versus one percent mean? Well, oneness versus one percent is really about two worldviews. One of interconnectedness, solidarity, equality, justice, where every species, every being, every person has their rightful place, their rightful share of the earth's resources. And the one percent is the dominant elite. 1% in fact is an exaggerated number, it should be 0.001% because according to studies there are 68 rich men controlling half the wealth of the world. So it's really about these two systems, two worldviews and sadly the 1% is driving species to extinction, driving people to dispossession and the oneness worldview is one where we can regenerate possibilities for what I've called the democracy of all life. Do you think the coming generation war is going to be on natural resources and it's concerning at the same time? I think the war over natural resources has been going on going ever worse. since colonialism started. Mm. Colonialism was a war against the natural resources of other countries. America belonged to the indigenous people there, it was grabbed from them, 90% were killed. India's land was not property of the peasants, but used by the peasants, announced to be property of England, and Lagan started being extracted. True. And it was, at one level it was a war, 60 million people, people died, died. because of famine, because of extraction. That's a war. And then you come to industrialism. Every war Everywhere. of the last century is over oil and gas. Yeah. If you look at the Middle East, why is it? just non-stop wars. Why was Syria invaded? Why was Iraq mm. invaded? They are all wars for natural resources. Um, the wars of the future will be over everything being reduced to natural resources. The British reduced land to a resource and property. Then in the age of Monsanto, seeds were reduced to property. property. And, and seed wars are real wars, you know. I've lived through them. This is my generation, mm. trying to own and pattern the seed, driving farmers to suicide. 400,000 farmers ending their lives is a war. Future wars are both about us as human beings being reduced to human raw material. Mm. Because they now say data is the big oil. Big oil, yeah. If data is the big oil, where is it coming from? Mm. Human beings. We are generating the data using a computer with your smart watch what? while you're doing your running. Every bit of that data, your, the pace of your pulse, your blood, your heartbeat, it's all being taken, mm -hmm. being turned into raw material to then be commodified to manipulate you. Mm -hmm and to modify you. It's called behavioral, behavioral science. science. And there's a brilliant book by a Harvard economist called Surveillance Capitalism. Hmm. That's basically saying that the next stage of capitalism is human beings as the raw material for capitalism. Uh, do you think the, the long back journey, there was like this green revolution came into picture. It was to help the nation? Now the green revolution never was called the Green Revolution in the early period. It was given the name later. Its basic purpose, as I've written in my book, The Violence of the Green Revolution, when I saw Punjab erupt in violence, the land where the Green Revolution was first implemented. The first purpose was selling fertilizers because mm -hmm. after the war, these companies that had made explosives and also fertilizers 
had no reason no. to exist. Mm. So they said, let's change agriculture to be the place where these fertilizers sell. But and our native seeds didn't adapt to them well. So Borlaug's dwarf varieties mm. were really about selling fertilizers. And if you read Borlaug, and I've quoted him in my book, he says, I would scream every day, fertilizer, give me more fertilizer. Mm. Uh, so it was about selling fertilizer. Selling fertilizer. Later, the narrative was evolved that it's about feeding the world. Mm. And a narrative was evolved that without it, India wouldn't have been fed. First, India was starving because of British colonialism oh, yeah. and extraction. Mm. The famine was not because we didn't know how to farm. After all, Albert Howard was sent to India in 1905 and learned organic farming from here and spread mm. it to the whole world. Our farming is the most sophisticated mm. system because we use mixtures, we use the law of return. Mm. We don't just take and take and take from the earth. We always mm. give back. Uh, and when you measure biodiversity, you realize that you can actually grow more food. Grow That's more what food. Navdanya does. Mm. We measure health per acre, not yield per acre. So if you want to feed the world, you grow more diversity. Mm. You want to starve the world, you grow a monoculture, monoculture. that does not go to food 90% of the Corn and soya being grown in the world today hmm. is going to biofuel and animal feed because a commodity, it doesn't hmm. matter what it's used for. So it's no more food. And that's why there's hunger. Hmm. One billion people are hungry. And the industrial system is at the root of hunger. The Green Revolution was at the root of destruction of nature. Hmm. The soils died. The rivers died. In the water conflicts of Punjab, Punjab yeah. are because... The Green Revolution uses 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food as an organic system. And worse, food is supposed to give you health. And here is a train that's leaving Punjab mm. called the cancer train. Cancer train. So, so many farmers are dying these days. Yes. It's, it's very concerning at the same time. Yeah. So what can be done to save this whole circle? So, whole circle, the vicious circle which is going on. I think the first step that we have to do is n n not accept the myths. Mm. That one crop feeds the world. No, we need all kinds of crops. You know. Secondly, that chemicals increase productivity. No, they don't. When you measure productivity as in a true way. Next, industrial agriculture is subsidized up to four hundred billion dollars a day uh, annually my god no for 400 billion uh, annually, annually that's more than a billion a day now that can make highest cost production look cheap that cheap artificial cheap is then dumped on farmers and farmers who've grown an honest crop are not able to sell it sell. that's why farmers are in distress two reasons the costs of production are going up the seeds are owned by the companies Chemical use is going up, and when they take the tomato to the market, it has, brings nothing. They take the onion, they're dumping it. Look at the levels of dumping of cash crops. Mm. Uh, so we have to, A, create biodiverse systems, which is what Navdanya does. Mm. The second thing we have to do is we have to shed chemicals because they're reason for the destruction of biodiversity, poisoning of the earth, and the creation of disease for people. The third thing we have to do is because everyone must eat. Hmm. We must shift from global supply chains, which are only for the big corporations to distribute commodities, hmm. to local markets everywhere, the way we used to have hearts Heart. everywhere. Local markets from our work has shown that if a farmer has an option to sell locally in the village or sell in a nearby village, or sell under their decision of a price, mm. they're earning 10 times more than the farmers chasing the cash crop. The beautiful farmers of Yamanaghati, from where you come, grow the best rajma. Best rajma. rajma farmers are earning 100 times more than the soya bean farmers. Mm. Yeah? So we have to grow diversity, chemical free, and localize. Localize. Uh, we talk about, I've, I've seen you most of the time talk about Bill Gates. Do you, do you believe that Bill Gates is really a philanthropist? No, he's not. We not, not only have I done a book called Oneness versus One yeah. Percent, when I watched how 
he was now taking over new fields. But uh, with movements of the world, whether it's in education or in health or in media or in agriculture, every field is being taken over by him. Yeah. So we pulled uh, the studies of movements together and we've done a book called Philanthro Capitalism. Capitalism. The, Bill Gates is not a philanthropist because he gives a little bit of money oh. to take over entire sectors. I work on seed. The big seed banks are called the CJR system. He gives a million here, but he takes all the seeds of that system, the ICRISAT system. All of these seed banks of the world, he now controls by giving mm. a tiny bit. But that's not where he stops. He then develops, promotes technologies for patenting, gene editing technologies, uh, digital sequence technologies. So he controls the seeds of the world, he finances the Swalbard Seed Bank, then he ta creates patent systems mm. and he destroys the international system that controls the country's rights to their seed, the Convention on Biological Diversity, mm. the FAO Treaty on Seed. He destroys and undercuts them so that all the seeds of the world are his seeds and he can be the new Monsanto oh, on a global okay. scale. That's why he's buying more farmland? Yes, he's the biggest farmland owner of America. But he's also the one who has created in his book, uh, How to Deal with a Climate Catastrophe. He cooked up a word, which I had never heard before that, called net zero. And he said, we, can, we have to solve climate problems by net zero. It doesn't mean we get rid of emissions. Mm. We will he flies a, a private jet and has all the private jet services of the mm -hmm. world. He says, it doesn't mean we'll stop polluting. He says, it just means we have to find other people's lands for offsets to absorb our pollution. So he bought all the land in America, but he wants our land for carbon offsets. And this is the net zero they're trying to push in the climate discussions. It's My a land God. grab. As we are talking about the climate thing, I got to know that Obama was once the part of Singapore UN Climate Summit. Yes. There were five countries who participated at the same time. If, if if this is concerning, the why these people are giving access to all the climate conditions like, okay, let's go for it, give the thumbs yeah. up for the, for the condition yeah. and this thing. See, I was part of the original treaty making okay. in Rio, the Earth Summit, 1992. 1992. The Biodiversity Convention was created there and the Climate Convention was created there. It was a legally binding convention to stop the polluters from polluting. Simple logic. Obama beginning with Singapore and then going on to Copenhagen, Copenhagen, got the five countries and said, why should we have a legally binding treaty? And let's have voluntary commitments. And he announced it while the countries were still negotiating inside. He killed the UN treaty. And then after he had killed it, Mr. Bill Gates arrives in Paris and walks away with this privatized treaty in effect. We were leading at that time both to say the polluters must stop, but also the rights of all people. That time America was saying one Indian is like 15 American, uh, 15 Indians are like one American. Well, American. And therefore, if, we, if an Indian dies, the cost, cost is yeah. 115. One. And I helped write the speech for my minister. And we wrote that this is an economics of genocide. Yeah, if you okay. treat some human beings as less, and you say, genocide. therefore, we can kill them, you're basically saying hmm. we will commit genocide, genocide through climate havoc. Right now, climate has become the biggest money spinner. Bill Gates is wanting geoengineering to change the climate of the world by putting pollutants into the sky. He is now investing in a very big way in fake food and lab food exactly. with patents. 14 patents to the Impossible Burger. Hmm. He and Silicon Valley people have huge investments in this lab food. That also means we will get sicker, sicker. but the new research is showing it's 25 times more damaging to the climate when you take the full cycle into account because it's very energy intensive. Hmm. Offsets for carbon, carbon trading, an issue of land grab, hmm. net zero. They're rushing with this. Why are southern countries getting into it? First, because they've been trapped in debt. You know, I know countries, Nepal, 
willing to sell its forest functions. True. Yeah. Sri Lanka already sold its water functions, water functions yeah. because they're in debt and someone comes and says, here's yeah. some money, yeah. but now we'll have rights to your ecosystems. And the billionaires of the world, beginning with Rockefeller, Rockefeller yeah. before the Glasgow summit on climate, came up with a new natural asset company. Rock. And they're basically saying, now the only way to deal with all of this is we, the billionaires, should own entire ecosystems, the entire mountains. We should own all the tropical rainforests. We should own all the soil of the world. And if we do that and then put it on Wall Street to speculate financially, oh like God. in the 2008 crisis, they speculated on housing and brought the world economy down. They say, if we speculate on water and on oxygen and on the way the leaf functions, we can make $4,000 trillion. So their thing, seeing big money, governments which are partly indebted but partly not thinking, are saying, thoda sa de do, mm. lelo. Take our land, take our ecosystems, take our rights, displace our people. And that is the resource war we are mm. living through right now. A lot of people don't know about what, what GMO seeds are. Can you please explain to the people who really don't know yeah. so far what exactly this yeah. thing is? So a real seed, in Hindi we call it Bija. Ja means life. Bija is that from which life arises on its own forever and ever. I take a paddy seed, I put it into the soil. It will give me a thousand paddy hmm. grains. I give a, put a rajma into the soil. It will hmm. give me hundreds of rajma seeds. Seed. Uh, so it multiplies, hmm. it regenerates on its own. And most importantly, it spreads through the bees, through the pollinators. Hybridization was the first step the companies took to say, farmers shouldn't save seeds. So we'll hybridize, so the next generation of mm. seed does not breed true. But the, there was still a plant, right. but it would not give good rajma. Mm. It would not give more rice, so you couldn't use it. Mm. But GMO, genetically modified seeds, they add a gene that doesn't belong to that plant mm. through two technologies. One is shooting with a gene gun or infecting with a plant cancer called agrobacterium. But because every organism has a tendency to reject what doesn't belong to them, mm. they have to add viral promoters and pump up the expression. But also, you know, there's a hundred thousand cells in the Petri dish and you're shooting blindly. Maybe one cell absorbed this gene. So you have to separate it from the others. Mm. So you put in antibiotic resistance markers. So a GMO has antibiotic resistance, viruses, toxic genes like BT or Roundup Ready. And it's been done because it, it's linked to patenting. That mm. was the main purpose. main purpose. At a meeting in 1987, this is what the industry said. Mm. This is why I save seeds. So seed will be free, seed will multiply. Farmers can exchange seed because once you have a patent, you treat the seed as your property hmm. and you treat a farmer saving seed as an intellectual property thief. It hmm. becomes a crime. Right. In America, farmers went to a grain market and bought soya bean and planted it. Monsanto sued them. Supreme Court of America has ruled even 20 years down the line, the grain from the seed is the property of Monsanto because it is a self-replicating machine that Monsanto invented. Oh so God. not only is the nature of the seed to multiply being taken away, the nature of the seed to renew is being taken away, most importantly, a living system that brings life mm. is being reduced to a machine and a manufacturer. So it's a foundational redefinition of the world. Same thing, you, you, you think the, this COVID also came into the existence, the vaccination got imposed to the people, it was, not, it was introduced by the 1%? Well, there's enough research, I mean, in the beginning, it was very difficult to understand. Because, you know, our countries, democratic countries, are all crazy in their own ways. Hmm. They wouldn't all do lockdown in the same way. They wouldn't all do chai foot ki duri in the hmm. same way. You hmm. know, it was too uniform too uniform, the response to it was too uniform. Second thing is now it's very clear, A, that rehearsals were done. Mm. Second, 
that the patents on these vaccines were taken before COVID broke. Mm. You know, so if you put the pieces together, and now there's so many cases that the people in, uh, you know, Fauci knew, mm. and he was financing the Wuhan lab where this gain of function research mm. to change the virus was being done. Now, all this is out on the table. And, uh, and the fact that it was A, genetically modified, mm -hmm. two, it was from a lab leak, and three, the vaccines were ready before the disease. Mm. All this is now becoming clearer. Mm. And one more thing is, you see, the chemical industry was born in Hitler's Germany mm. through a company called IG Farben and the American partners. Bio was mm. with Monsanto, Monsanto even then. Rockefeller, Rockefeller worked with IG Farben. Mm. DuPont worked with IG Farben. Now, these companies didn't just bring us the chemicals in agric uh, agriculture, the pesticides, the herbicides, the mm. fertilizer. But Rockefeller is also the one who brought us the big pharmaceutical industry. We, you know, health is something we've known about. Mm. Ayurveda is 5,000, 10,000 years oh. old. And it has been an amazing scientific tradition because it means the science of life. It is still treating people. Mm. During COVID, Ayurveda yeah, yeah. was healing people. Healing people. Yeah? people going to hospital with ventilators were dying. Mm. Ayurveda was helping people. So big pharma and big poison in ag are the mm. same players. Mm. And the poisons give you cancer, mm. like Monsanto Bayer uses glyphosate, which gives you cancer. And then Bayer has the patented cancer drugs. Mm. Yeah? All these industries are already monopolizing drugs to deal with the side effects of the vaccines. So it's a, you know, create a disease and offer the cure and make money twice. Mm. And that's why freedom today has to be to know how life works, system thinking, systems knowledge of life, understand that there are tremendous knowledge systems in the world, Ayurveda, living sciences, quantum theory, mm. which is what I've studied. Third, take care of the earth, take care of your health, Mm. Nothing is more important. Right. So, uh, like a person like me who's, who's going out and doing job and everything, how we can contribute as being with such a big ecosystem, how we can contribute a small bit of our, like to make yeah. the change, the big change? You know, in recent years, we've all become much more mobile. Um, most of us are not in one place. And in the process, we have become prey to eating whatever is brought forward, junk food. Now, junk food, which is ultra-processed food, is responsible for 75% of the diseases we eat. Mm. So no matter who you are, three things we have to do. We have to eat healthy food. It's not a luxury. If it means packing mm. your tiffin box from home, mm. pack it from home. If it means finding an organic place, go eat in that place. Second, Create food communities. Third, find a farmer or a group of farmers to whom you relate. Because food, in my view, is the ultimate currency of life. Yes. Current means is that which flows. Yeah. Food is what flows from the soil to the plants to our gut. Mm. And if it's the currency of life, this is the currency we must strengthen. To strengthen it, we must take care of the soil, but we must take care of the farmer who takes care of the soil. So we cannot afford this huge gulf that has been created between rural India and urban India, because food still connects us. Mm -hmm. If we don't connect to our farmers, we won't be connected through health. If we are connected through American agribusiness, through Pepsi and Coke, mm -hmm. and Mr. Gates with his fake food, not only will we be very sick, the very fabric of our society, which is held by the farmers, will be destroyed. India is India mm. because of rural India. Rural India. You, can, you can go from Garhwal to Kashmir to Bengal to Kerala. It's the villages mm. where this diversity is alive. Mm. The biodiversity of our farming mm. and the cultural diversity of our cultures. Mm. 
In the cities, you see the same McDonald's, the same Coke, the same Pepsi, the same jeans. So you want India to thrive as a civilization, mm -hmm. defend its food culture, defend its ecological heritage. Mm. So I was traveling up again on the mountains where I, I belong. I'm a Pahadi boy. I belong from the same place. So I've seen these days people are coming down in the cities, seeing other people. This the modern I think is going well and they are not getting that luxury there. So how can we make sure that the farmers stick to their own roots and try to do things which he was earlier doing? Uh, you know, because from 1984, I've dedicated my life to understanding food and ag farming and doing an agriculture that works. Mm. If I show you the graph, since globalization and neoliberal uh, policies, which began with the World Bank's structural mm -hmm. adjustment in 91 and then mm -hmm. with the World, World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. the price of food is going up like this. Mm, right. And earlier, the price of food and what the farmer earned used to have a difference of 6%. Assuming that there are three middle traders, mm -hmm. each of whom could take 2%, that was the ethics and law of this country. So three people, one from the farmer to the market, one other market, 6% difference. And then as this globalization kept going, the price of food is increasing. What the farmer earns is collapsing. collapsing. And our most recent study shows that farmers are getting between 1 to 5% of what the consumer pays. Mm. The rest is going to big agribusiness. But it's not just that the farmer is getting 1%. Mm. In addition, the farmer is spending money on right, fertilizers on pesticides. Mm. So they're in a negative economy. Who will stay in a negative economy? Mm. Now we can either say we'll stay in a negative economy and be a satellite of American agribusiness and become sick, destroy our farmers, destroy our land, or we will reclaim our food sovereignty. Mm. We will protect the earth. Mm. We will give our farmers a fair price, which is what the MSP debate is really about, that government have to regulate markets. markets. That's why we have an Essential Commodities Act. Mm. Because when the market wasn't regulated, the British were starving us while exporting for profit. And the third thing we have to do is realize that health begins in food. Only healthy food should reach people. Mm. Poisoned food should not. should not. Why should it be difficult for an organic farmer to bring their market? food to a market right. and someone poisoning the food and giving you cancer can bring it freely. So quality food should not be treated as a luxury because the bad food is creating the huge, huge food bills. Farmers are dying because of debt. Mm. The rest are dying because of poison. Families are selling homes and land because someone in the family got cancer. Mm. And so we have to repair the food system. And we know exactly how to do it. Mm. It's Beautiful. just that that one percent makes so much money mm. off the earth and off the farmers and off our sickness that they have huge influence on our governments to push the wrong policy. And to me, the fact that we became free through an independence movement was based on Swaraj, mm. Swaraj. Swadeshi, Swadeshi. Satyagraha. Swaraj means we must know how to govern ourselves. What we eat should be our uh, choice. knowledge and choice. Right. We shouldn't be force fed GMOs and poisons. Mm. Second, Swadeshi, we must, just like in freedom we made our own cloth and burned the British clothing, we should grow our own food. This is the beat Swaraj and Anna Swaraj that we promote. And third, where the options are being forced on us, just like the salt tax was pushed on us. And Gandhi walked to the sea, picked up the salt, said nature gives it for free. We need it for survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your laws. We need to do that about our food now. We will not obey your laws that create a food fascism, forcing us to eat bad food, killing our farmers. We will now not obey your junk laws. Mm. We will lo obey the laws of the earth, the laws of the amazing Indian ecological civilization Inherited. that we have inherited. Mm. 
the values of respecting the earth, Annadata Sukhi Bhava, how can that civilization mm. say Annadata commit suicide? It's not acceptable. Beautiful. Why all the farmers are forced to do monoculture thing? Uh, when I grow biodiversity, I have freedom. If I'm growing my rajma, but I'm also growing my millets, I'm also growing my rice, and it could be either in the same field or in different fields. I have food for the market mm. that allows me to pay for my okay. child's fees. Yes. Uh, and I have food for the family. Monocultures have been promoted and pushed on farmers, first because chemical farming requires monocultures, mm. because when you put an external input on anything, you have to create uniformity. When you allow things to grow together, they grow in symbiosis, mm. they give and take. Yeah. Each of them is different. Mm. Each human being evolves mm. differently. Mm. Each plant is able to be different. So chemicals need monocultures. Monoculture. Commodity farming needs monocultures because then one company can go and buy up all the grain. Mm. And sadly, there is an idea of cluster farming being promoted. But in our mountains, the high altitude field is very different from the middle field, is very different from the, from the valley. Valleys, yeah. And the north side is very different from the southern okay. side. So to put one crop because it's easy for the agribusiness mm. is violating of all ecological principles of good farming. And, it's, and it's, so it's the convenience of trade that promotes monocultures and everything in policy pushes the monocultures. So in Navdanya we say, no, grow biodiversity. Mm. First, grow food for the earth. Second, grow food for your family because you also have to eat. Third, create local markets. Mm. And fourth, wherever you sell, sell at a fair price. And that's how we right. organize the farmers to never ever undercut themselves. And how this BT cotton was introduced? Illegally. Illegally. BT cotton was introduced in India in 98. I wouldn't have come to know about it, but full page ads had been put in newspapers. And in the corner was a logo called Bolgard. Now I had been studying GMOs and I knew Bolgard was the trade name of Monsanto's BT cotton, in which a toxic gene has been put into the plant. So the plant is making its own pesticide. It had failed the farmers of Texas. So when this huge ad was put and it said, next year Indian farmers will be getting Bolgard cotton, because I'd been involved in these policies in India. Yeah. I rang up the environment ministry. I said, did you give an approval because we have a genetic engineering approval committee? They said, no, we don't know Monsanto. We don't know Meaty Cotton. No one came to us. I rang up the Ministry of Agriculture because in India, 22 agroecological regions exist. In 22 places, the seed must be tested before it's allowed, allowed in, the in the market. I asked them, did they? He said, no one came to us. So I prepared a case. And I sued Monsanto, but I sued the government for sleeping. I said, we have laws to prevent such action. So from 98, I, I think in January 99, I filed the case, till 2002, they were not allowed to sell. Now in March 2002, BT cotton was found in Gujarat. Ministry of Environment is very dangerous. Souls will be destroyed. Pollinators will be destroyed. Uproot it, uproot it, uproot it. March. Early April. They approve Monsanto's BT cotton, so it's totally safe. I said, five days ago it was unsafe. Now it's become safe. Uh, so then they pushed. Right now they are spreading Roundup Ready BT cotton. So the first GMO is BT toxin. Second GMO is Roundup resistance. They've stacked the two genes. Roundup is a chemical herbicide that kills every plant, except the plant engineer to survive it. So it's destroying everything green around and it is spreading all over. I go, I can see Roundup has been sprayed here in Vidarbha and Vidarbha has ended up being a big center for suicides. 400,000 suicides have taken place in India since 95, of which 85% are in the cotton areas. 95% of the cotton is now Monsanto's BT cotton. And this the Competition Commission of India has recognized to say this is prima facie a monopoly. And the four pockets where it grows is Punjab, the yeah. Batinda side, uh, Vidarbha, Andhra and Karnataka. 
So if you look at the suicide data, this is where the data is the highest. It was introduced illegally. It should by now have been stopped. We fortunately stopped the BT um, eggplant. They are trying even now to introduce it. Uh, I have watched not just India's case, but since I've advised so many governments around the world, everywhere where a GMO entered, it was introduced illegally. Mm. I was advising the government of Brazil, the GMO was brought illegally, then they were made legal. And now they're spraying so much Roundup. I think it's 50% more. My God. Yeah. Argentina, the cancer rates are so high. And because this sprayed from the sky, if I have a little garden, which I'm feeding my family with, mm -hmm. and the plane comes with Roundup, mm. my entire garden is finished and I get cancer. So not only are the GMO technologies pushed by the same industry that brought us poison, but they are basically designed to spread more poisons, Roundup and pesticides. But more than that, to create a monopoly on seed, which should be everyone's. Seed is a commons. Common. Seed belongs to the seed. Farmers have a right to save and exchange seed. And that's where for me, Beat Swaraj is mm -hmm. the ultimate freedom of nature and the ultimate freedom of farmers and the ultimate sovereign freedom of our country. If we become seed dependent, we are enslaved. Hmm. Beautiful. And what this persistent pesticide means? Persistent pesticides are pesticides that survive in the environment mm -hmm. because the industry has always said, oh, it disappears. Disappears, yeah. Best persistent pesticides and persistent organic phosphates are those that survive in the environment. And therefore, long after spraying, they're in the food that you eat. Well, that's the main reason. Yeah. One, long back, Sri, uh, Sri Lanka said that we are doing all organic farming. Was it true? No. The story of Sri Lanka has been very distorted by the same industry. Sri Lanka had got into deep debt yeah. for the typical reasons, you know, building big ports, yeah, yeah. building big highways. And, uh, uh, and then the COVID struck and the lockdown happened. Now, Sri Lanka depends on three big economic activities for foreign exchange, exchange. income yeah. through which they pay back the debt. First is tourism. Tourism. During Finished. COVID, no tourism. Mm -hmm. Second is their exports of spices and things. Exports were destroyed, the economy was destroyed. And third is expatriate earnings of Sri Lankans working overseas. But those economies are also shut. shut. So they come back and there's no repatriation of any mm -hmm. foreign exchange. So there was no foreign exchange to pay. At that time, the president saw that Sri Lanka was paying 300 million for importing fertilizers, and he just announced a ban. Mm. Now, banning fertilizers does not mean an organic policy. Mm. Organic policy means you must have the seeds, you must train your farmers, train your farmers. you must have markets for them. Mm -hmm. That is the organic policy. Right. A ban on fertilizer doesn't translate into organic policy. Mm. Of course, there was the industry organized, but others organized. In six months, he had to withdraw the ban, and then he had to run away because of the debt crisis. crisis. But they've made it look like it's the six month ban okay. destroyed Sri Lanka of what happened right. before. Mm. And the organic farmers of Sri Lanka are doing fine. Mm. Because I've been working with them for 40 years. My God. They've come here for training. You know? So actually, if you just honestly think of it, what does organic do? Organic allows you to get rid of the high expenses on chemicals and seeds. Positive income. Organic allows you to regenerate the soil. And the minute your soil is regenerated, your productivity increases. Positive income. Organic gives you consciousness that your food is good. And so in villages I have watched, poor people go and get from an organic neighbor. Farmers we have trained mm. will take a basket, basket of vegetables to the village square in the morning and in one eye, it is all gone because the poorest of people knows the difference between bad taste and good taste. Mm. When the GMO lobby led to the ban on mustard oil in 98 in India, same year as BT cotton introduction, mm -hmm. it was the women of the slums. He said, Hamara Sarsom Vapisla. 
हम सोया नहीं खा सकते दे आर द वंस हु वर अवेयर ऑफ द डिफरेंस ऑफ हेल्थ एंड टेस्ट सो ऑर्गेनिक is an improvement in pharmacy can we have a book called wealth pareka and organic farmers are earning 10 times more because they're getting rid of the un- unnecessary cost and they're getting a fair price the combination of shedding the cost and improving your income hmm. is a good economy. economy so the true organic farm and and the other example is in i think 80s america put a sanction against cuba hmm. and cuba used to import its oil and fertilizer yeah. cuba could not could not overnight cuba shifted to organic organic i have been there i have launched the organic campaign and unlike other countries the scientists led it the top scientists started to work on soil i have seen how in the village square the urban gardens put vegetable for free for people to take the small farms around havana are feeding havana tractors disappeared because there was no oil but the horses came back mm. and the same thing that they say made sri lanka sink made that's made cuba, cuba prosper so the issue is the crisis is not because of organic mm. the crisis is because of debt and no no society and no individual can keep de- going deeper into debt hmm. and come out well so true my last question we see market full of organic thing we call it organic this is coming in the market is it so this much organic thing we have already in the market no we don't yeah in avania we we have worked now for since the 80s hmm to train farmers yeah. to work with them to hold their hand but i can tell you that the combination of climate change and the fact that the market is so vacillating mm. means that the organic farming is not exploding the way it should mm. if it had all the intentional policy support of mm. government support but this much i feel very proud that in garhwal you know everyone used to eat millets but no one in the cities knew so when i started the marketing for the farmers i used to load my jeep and take it to delhi nobody knew what's manwan jagora then i take the farmers and say sikhao in it but then nobody wanted to eat a chapati so we started to say new ways with old grains we started to make pizza with ragi we started to make uh, tabule with jagora and then we had a cafe in delhi hat at that time we took a pledge these forgotten foods we have to make them future foods mm. and now millets this is the year of millets and it's all that invisible work of farmers over 3 4 decades of not allowing millets to disappear and in fact uttarakhand was created with the slogan mandwa jangora khayenge uttarakhand banayenge yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. It was a beautiful session.